Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Let's open in prayer. Lord, I pray that you open our eyes, that we may see the wonderful things that you have for us in your word this morning. Help us to focus on what you want us to learn. Help us to be willing to obey it, even when it doesn't make sense. Make us men of your word today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, when I think about this Bible study, I think about Psalm 133, which is one of the Psalms that I'm covering uh, this morning, um, but I won't be covering it in detail, but I will read it. It says, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. And that's what I think of when I think of Saturday mornings. I think of all these men coming together and dwelling in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Joe Danko. Oh, no, no. On the beard of Aaron. On the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the, on the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. You know, as you know, when you're covering so much material, it's impossible for us to do it justice. So I have to like focus in. And so that's what I'm going to be doing this morning. You know, last week though, I want to start... Pat mentioned a lost psalm that's not in our Bible. It's referred to as Psalm 151. It's true. Uh, The Greek translation of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint, includes an extra psalm, which is often referred to as Psalm 151. And it is said to be written by David after he slew Goliath. And here's how it goes. It's short, so I I can read it. I was small among my brothers and the youngest in my father's house. I tended my father's sheep. My hands made a harp. My fingers fashioned a lyre. And who will tell my Lord? The Lord himself. It is he who hears. It was he who sent his messenger and took me from my father's sheep and anointed me with his anointing oil. My brothers were handsome and tall, but the Lord was not pleased with them. I'm sure his brothers love that verse. Uh, (laughs) I went out to meet the Philistine, and he cursed me by his idols. But I drew his own sword. I beheaded him and took away disgrace from the people of Israel. So it is true. It's in this Septuagint. There's a couple of reasons why it's not included in our Bibles. One is that the psalm is not part of the traditional Masoretic Hebrew text. Another is that traditional Judaism considers Psalm 151 to be part of the Apocrypha. And then a third is that even though Psalm 151 appears in the Septuagint, the translators of that version marked it as, quote, not of the number. They didn't consider Psalm 151 to be an official part of the biblical canon. So my opinion on this is I'm glad they left it out. I mean, there's nothing in it that contradicts scripture or anything like that, but it just seems like it would be better fit in like the books of Samuel or Kings or something like that. If you, when you, when you read it, it doesn't fit in the Psalms because as the Psalms progress in number, they move from lament to praise so much so that the last five Psalms are all about praise. And so Here's my plan for this morning. I'm going to share just a few remarks about the book of Psalms in general, then a quick overview of book five of the Psalms, and then we're going to spend a good chunk of time looking at Psalm 119. And after that, I'm hoping that we still have time that if there's any of you here that have a Psalm that's in this section that you would like to share that really stood out to you in your reading this week, I want to give you the opportunity to share with with the others what, what you're learning through the Psalms. So 
and we've talked about the Psalms the last couple of weeks. So I, I, I try, I'm trying not to like duplicate what the other guy said. The book of Psalms is the third longest book in the Bible with 150 Psalms in the collection. Does anyone know what the longest book of the Bible is? Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the longest book of the Bible with over 33,000 words. So Jeremiah is the longest book. Genesis is the second longest. And then Psalms is the third longest. The Psalms were composed over a period of approximately a thousand years and written by more than 10 authors. Although King David was the primary author who wrote at least 73 of them. And I like here what this uh, Peter Kreft, this author and professor, says about the Psalms. He says, the Psalms are like an ocean fed by many rivers and many writers. They are for wading in, bathing in, swimming in, surfing in, boating in, and even drowning in. For even the mystics have loved and used them too. The Psalms will last forever. It's hard to think about our Bible without Psalms. Because they're so, they're just so meaningful. They're, they're, they're like written down prayers. Let's talk about Jesus in the book of Psalms. Jesus used and quoted Psalms more than any other part of the Old Testament. Nearly half of all the direct quotes taken from the Old Testament, quoted in the New Testament, come from the Psalms. In fact, the book of Psalms is either quoted or alluded to 103 times in the book of Revelation, just the book of Revelation, and 149 times in the gospel accounts. Jesus began and concluded his earthly ministry by quoting from the Psalms. In John chapter 2, verse 17, it says that his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And that's a quote from Psalm 69, 9. And then when Jesus was on the cross, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus calling out in a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. That was taken from Psalms 31, verse 5. So, and then I love this, that Jesus claimed that the Psalms were written all about him. In, in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, it says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. That must be why he referenced the Psalms so many times in his ministry. And then during the Passover celebration, it was customary to recite Psalm 136 or the Psalms 113 to 118. And it's believed that Jesus probably recited or sung those Psalms that, th during his Last Supper. So what does the Psalms teach us? Well, many of the main of the Bible's main ideas uh, are echoed in the Psalms. Praise, thanks, thankfulness, faith, hope, sorrow for sin, worship for God's loyalty, love, his unwavering help. The writers of the Psalms always express their true feelings. That's one of the things I love about the Psalms. Whether they're praising God for his blessings or complaining to him in times of trouble. And they teach us that no matter what we're going through, we too can praise him and await the victory. The Psalms teach us to praise. They teach us about prophecy. They teach us about pain. You see so much pain in the Psalms. The psalmist going, you know, expressing his pain to God. There's, they teach us about petition, how to offer up requests. They teach us how, actually how to pray. I mean, I don't know about you, but I learned a lot about prayer just by meditating on the Psalms. And actually praying through the Psalms is a great discipline to learn. The Psalms are like poetry. The psalmist pens his words in a poetic fashion meant to be sung often. So our focus is going to be on book five this morning, which is Psalms 107 to 150. And we, we talked a little bit about this in the past weeks. Why book five? Well, because 
the Jewish people divided the book of Psalms into five books to align them with the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So book five is aligned with the book of Deuteronomy. In Psalm 117, it says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. That's the shortest psalm in the Bible. It's a, it actually, it might be the shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 117, a great place to start memorizing. It's a great, it's a great verse, too. And by the way, if you take a Bible and you open it right in the middle, where does it land? It lands right in Psalms. And if you do it correctly, it should land right in Psalm 118, which 118 is between the shortest chapter of the Bible and the longest chapter of the Bible. Now, many of you will go home and try this and it won't work. And it's not going to work because you have all this stuff at the end of your Bibles. You know, it has to be like, the, you know, just the Bible for that to work. 15 of the Psalms in this section, uh, 120 to 134, are called the Song of the Sense. And they were sung by the Jewish people as they made their way up to Jerusalem in the annual feast. And by the way, if you go to Israel with me, we will do this. When we go into Jerusalem, we will sing a Song of Ascent, which is really, really cool to think about how they did that and how we can do that even today. So a verse that came to my mind, trying to connect Deuteronomy with the book five of the Psalms, is Deuteronomy 29, 29. And it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. The things revealed, the things revealed about God is what these Psalms are all about. Now, this is the men of the word Bible study. And what it, you know, one of the most appropriate places for us to spend time together, especially considering the section, the, the, the chapters we're considering would be to look at one Psalm, which is Psalm 119. Because this chapter teaches us about the greatness and the glory of God's word. And it should encourage every single one of us that what we're doing here on Saturday mornings is not a waste of time. It's worth every second to spend time in God's word. The purpose of this psalm is to celebrate God's word and instruction to his people. It's used by the Jewish tradition to celebrate the Jewish New Year. And this holiday is the first of a series of holidays, which in English is translated the days of awe. The days of awe. I like that. It's fitting to use this psalm in, the, in this setting because the psalmist beautifully expresses awe and adoration for, of God and his word. And one of the verses that's commonly used is verse 72 of Psalm 119. It says, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I love what Charles Spurgeon said about Psalm 19. Here's a quote from him. He says, quote, This wonderful psalm, from its great length, helps us wonder at the immensity of Scripture. From its keeping to one subject, it helps us adore the unity of Scripture. For it is but one. Yet from the many turns it gives to the same thought, it helps us to see the variety of Scripture. I bear witness that this sacred song is charmingly varied from beginning to end. Its variety is that of a kaleidoscope. From a few objects, a boundless variation is produced. In the kaleidoscope, you look once, and there is a strangely beautiful form. You shift the glass a little, and another shape, equally delicate and beautiful, is before your eyes. So it is with this psalm, end quote. It's a great quote, isn't it? So we can say that Psalm 119 is a kaleidoscope to the glory and greatness of God's word. Now, before we dive in, 
just a little bit about the structure of Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is, is composed of 22 different stanzas because the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters and each stanza is every, the first word of, of every verse starts with the letter of that, that letter of their alphabet. And there's a tradition in the Eastern Orthodox Church that King David used this psalm to teach his son Solomon both the Hebrew alphabet, but also the alphabet of the spiritual life. Some people think that 176 different people wrote one verse to put this psalm together during the exile of about 450 B.C., so what I'm saying is we don't know who the author is of this particular song. But I think that it might be Ezra. Other people think that it was the priest, prophet Ezra, who wrote all of Psalm 119. And I think it might be Ezra in light of what Ezra 7.10 says about his life mission. Ezra 7.10, it's a great memory verse, by the way. It was actually Jerry Bridges' life verse. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Ezra was a teacher, and this psalm was written by a teacher. So I kind of vote for Ezra as being maybe the author of this psalm. Well, I guess we'll find out one day in heaven, won't we? As far as the length of the psalm, it's about the same length as the books of Ruth, James, or Philippians. Many have memorized the entire psalm. Maybe you know someone who has. A couple, like people that stood out to me, Blaise Pascal memorized the whole Psalm 119. William Wilberforce memorized Psalm 119. David Livingston, the famous missionary, memorized the whole psalm. And then there's two interesting stories that I found related to this psalm. Matthew Henry has one of the best commentaries that, that's, that's out there, and it's, it's been around for 200 years. Well, he was introduced to Psalm 119 as a child by his father. His father is Philip Henry, and he told his children to take one verse of Psalm 119 every morning to meditate on. Thereby, he would go through all of Psalm 119 twice in every year. And... His dad said to his children, that will bring you to be in love with all of the rest of scriptures. And, you know, maybe it was that practice as a child that led Matthew Henry, why he loved the Bible so much. And he spent so much time writing this commentary that, is a, that still exists, is around today. Pretty, pretty amazing. But then I found this, this story, this guy named George White Weishart. He was the Bishop of Edinburgh in the 17th century. And by the way, there's another George Weishart a hundred years earlier that was uh, a, a believer who was put to death for his faith. But this George Weishart had the same name and he was condemned to death for his faith. But when he was about to be put to death, he made use of a custom that allowed the condemned person to choose one psalm to be sung. You see where I'm going with this? There was a custom. You could sing one psalm. Guess which one he picked? Psalm 119. Before two-thirds of the psalm was sung, his pardon arrived and his life was spared. Can you believe that? If he would have sung one of those shorter psalms, he would have been dead. It's a true story. True story. Psalm 119 literally changed his, his life. Okay, so let's dive in. Big Dan, would you read Psalm 119 verses 1 to 8? And I just want everyone to notice how many different words are used to describe God's word. That's one of the beautiful things about Psalm 118, and we're going to look at some of those. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no, wrong, do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts 
they're going to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. What I want to do now is just look at the top seven Hebrew words used to describe God's word in this psalm. The first one is the word law or Torah, which is, which is used 25 times. And we find it here in verse one. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. The word law or Torah, its parent verb means to teach or direct. Therefore, coming from God, it means both law and revelation. It can be used of a single command or of a whole body, body of law. And then it's, it's repeated 25 times in this psalm. And so it's also the word law in verse 18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The second word, which we find in verse two, that Big Dan read, is the word testimonies. And that's the Hebrew word idat. It's used 23 times in this psalm, and it's related to the word witness. Makes sense. To obey his testimony signifies loyalty to the terms of the covenant bet made between the Lord and Israel. So that's, a, that's another word that's used to describe God's word. The third one is precepts. Precepts used 21 times. This word is drawn from the sphere of an officer or overseer, a man who is responsible to look closely into a situation and then take action. So the word points to a particular instructions of the Lord as one who cares about detail, says Derek Kidner in his commentary. And so in verse four, it says, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. And then in verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Another word is the word statutes, which is found 21 times in this psalm. This noun is derived from the root word engrave or inscribe. The idea is the written word of God and the authority of his written word, declaring his authority and power of giving us his laws. So verse five, oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. And then verse eight, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Part of what I'm trying to get across here is that whole idea of the kaleidoscope, okay? That, that we don't just use one word to describe God's word. It's a kaleidoscope, and it keeps changing. And you, you see it from different angles, and it's beautiful every time you see it. And so the, another word is commandments. Misbah, misbah. Used 22 times just in this psalm. The word emphasizes the straight authority of what is said, the right to give orders, Derek Kidner says in his commentary. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. And then in verse 10, with my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. And then there's the word judgments, mispatim, used 23 times in Psalm 119 means to judge or determine, regulate, regulate, order, and discern because they judge concerning our words and works. So we see this in verse seven I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. The word rules there is the word judgments. With my lips, I will declare all the rules or judgments of your mouth. So to find this, the, uh, the, the last one that I'm going to mention, and by the way, that's just seven of them. That's just the top seven. There's like many more used. We could spend a lot of time with all the different Hebrew words used. Ray, could you read um, 
Chapter 119, verses 9 through 16, please. How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. I love Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11. The great memory verses, especially when you're discipling men, right? Because... You know, we all know that every man struggles with pride, greed, and lust. <laughs> and so we need to combat those with God's word. And so I know for myself, Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11 have come to my rescue many a time. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. When I think about that, hiding God's word in my heart, I think if I have to, if I'm hiding it in my heart, I have to know it in my mind first. So that's why I need to scripture memory is so important. It's not something I have to do. It's something I get to do. I can reprogram my mind according to God's word. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode and remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace, and on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.